let's say. But I've been working in open source and sales since about 2005. Um, I don't just do tech things. If you ever want to talk about crochet, which I love crochet, uh, love comics or karaoke, which we did last night. Some of you all were there. Uh, just go out and find your karaoke community. If you like the WordPress community, even a little bit, um, there's a karaoke community in your community that, and wherever you're from, that is just as cool. People with just as much soul and passion about the, what they do. Just they're singing about it. Um, my slides for this and everything else I do are over on my personal website, mcduane.com. Uh, so go there and get these slides, because that's where we're going to make the books to the session. Uh, but before we get going any further, I want to know who's in the room. We don't have thousands of people in the room, but we have too many to go in one by one for introduction, so we'll just do the general grouping. Um, who here is a developer full time? Awesome. Who here is a designer? Awesome. Got any um, project managers in the room? Yeah, good for them. Uh, we got any uh, businessy folks? Uh, sales, marketing? Anybody wears all the hats? Awesome. <laughs> uh, who here does any kind of DevOps? Yes. That's who this talk really evolved out of. But who I'm hoping gets a lot out of this talk are people um, that aren't in DevOps, that know their machines can do things, but yeah. Anyway, um, do we have any content creators here? Yes. This will hopefully help you in the long run as well. Um, so, I have too many slides to get through no matter how much time they gave me. I could do like a four-hour workshop based on these slides. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to tell you a general high-level overview, let you get to the slides, dig in on your own time, and I'm more than happy to help you out if you get stuck in the future. But if you have no idea what Bash is, you've never touched the command line before, just chill, take some notes. The detailed notes will help you out later in life. If you're a casual user, open up a terminal and some of the advanced stuff is gonna blow your mind. Uh, if you are, can read that last statement, you don't really need to be here, but go to slides 107 and then go do something else today. Uh, I'm serious. Um, so when I originally wrote the name of this talk, I wanted to put a hashtag and a talk title to see if I could break input fields. And it turns out everyone had sanitized that. So um, and then I started focusing on what the talk itself would be. Bash, to me, has always been a certain kind of magic trick that it can do amazing things. And it's like, ooh, ah, like, wow, how did that developer do that? Um, but if you don't really understand it, you have to like start using, start using it. Uh, it starts looking a little more like this, which is also magic. Uh, and if you're familiar with Magic Gathering, because Lich is a great card, really great card, um, but wow, that's a lot of words on there, and how do you even apply that? What the heck? It's like going to Stack Overflow and seeing a code snippet, and be like, what on earth do I do with that? Where do I put that? What on earth is going on here? So when I was writing this talk, I was telling a buddy of mine who to work with, uh, I was struggling with it. Like, how do I formulate this into a general audience talk instead of just being a technical how-to? And he said this off the top of his head. I was like, I really like that. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's kind of a glue that holds things together. That's the whole point. It's the whole point of open source. But <laughs> people are really scared of what they don't understand, of what things that they encounter and just, it shouldn't be terrifying. But we're talking about your machines. And we've all gotten to situations where we feel like our machines are about to blow up. We don't know what we've done, we can't undo something, and that's the real fear. We spend days and years of our lives making our machines our machines, making them behave exactly the way we think they should behave. Uh, how many people have ever manually set up MAMP? Yeah, whoever wants to do it again. No, no hands. Um, and then you hear stories like this all the time, like the power bash, on the bad side, this actually was a made-up story. I did it for publicity, but um, <laughs> the underlying premise is true. Like, if you arm minus RF all the things, uh, yeah, this will happen. Um, but I asked the internet, like, how should I talk about this? And immediately Sarah got back, Sarah Kagan, and said, just don't be afraid of it. Just that's the thing to remember. And that's what I really hope you leave this room understanding that. <laughs> You have these machines in front of you, even if you just have a cell phone on you today, 
that has, uh, iPhone 5 has 13,000 percent more processing power than the, Italo, uh, the entire Apollo missions. All of them put together. Um, you have these devices that, like literally, uh, Grace Hopper, who was a person in the military, would have shot you in the face to get if she could have got this kind of technology 50 years ago. <laughs> and what do we do with it? We we watch videos on YouTube and we say, we are going to do the things that a developer said I can do with this machine through clicking these buttons and these configurations. But in all reality, you can do anything. And that's what I want you to walk out the room feeling like she right here, that if you just say, hey, I'm leveraging the power of this thing, I can do anything and I'm a superhero. So it got into a little bit of why. But from a more practical user perspective, I hate clicking buttons in GUIs. Just hate it. It is slow. And again, it is what the developers of that GUI had in mind with how I should use that device and how, how I should use that machine, which is good. But everybody follows the Prado, or Prado principle, the uh, 80-20 rule. Like, they're serving 80% of their clients, and the other 20%? Well, they got to figure out end rounds and weird buried menus, and uh, there's just ways to do things faster. And really, like why I'm talking about Bash is I hate repeating myself when I'm doing work. If I can do it once and then tell the machine to do it that way every time, why on earth wouldn't I do that? Who here likes setting up a WordPress website? I do. I actually do. It's, it's, a, it's a one script run, and I'm done. It's on a server, and I am ready to just start dropping in content. I actually like the process. Because it's literally one line I run on my command line. And eventually, no matter what you do in tech, you're going to run into this. Uh, it's just on GitHub. Just go get my repo on GitHub. And if you've never touched the command line or you don't know what GitHub is, like, it, that's, they're speaking nonsense. It's like some magical language they're speaking that makes no sense. <laughs> but at the end of it, you can tell a robot to do things over and over and over again through a script. And it will literally do that thing over and over and over again. If you've never seen the ASCII Star Wars, go look it up. It's brilliant. I'll show you a link at the end. Um, but that's it. You can tell the machine, do this thing in this order, and it will do it forever and ever and ever. So let's dig into what it is. Like, what are we actually talking about? Now that hopefully you're all on the side of, yes, automation is good, and repeating myself is bad. What about Bash, the born again shell? Funny name, great little logo. Why the Born Again Shell? Because a guy named Stephen Bourne wrote a thing called Shell, or SH, in 1979, working at Bell Labs. Back in the day, it was this thing called Unix. And he faced the fundamental problem of how do we move files around and manipulate files within the file system of this giant honking computer. So he invented a shell tool to do it. 1988, Stallman and Fox said, you know what? We really need this utility if we're going to like keep this whole GNU project going, because this is a fundamental problem with computer science. How do we move these files around and manipulate them? And ultimately, if you go to, if you go to uh, Wikipedia, it says this, and I don't disagree. This is a great definition. But I think it's a little long, because really, uh, you type commands, cause actions. That's, that's what Bash does. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is it, because... <sighs> One of the greatest reads I think I can recommend to anyone in their entire life is Neil Stevenson's In the Beginning Was the Command Line, which says, in an essence, like in, you know, a part of it, um, that we're communicating these boxes through telegraphs, through telegrams. That's, that's it. I'm pushing a key on a keyboard that's in an electronic signal into a machine. That is no different than me tapping a button and sending an electronic signal across a wire to someone else with the machine. It's the same exact principle. This is, we're teletyping, and we have been since the beginning. This has never changed. A GUI will put a nice little face on it and do the typing for you when you click a button, but it's still doing teletyping, from your clicks to what it actually processes on the CPU to what it spits back out. And if you don't believe me, that's basically all Alexa is. This is an actual doc, from, or an actual image from one of their docs. Natural language processing transforms whatever you say into a text message with metadata, sends it over to a serverless thing on Amazon, Lambda kicks back out an answer in the form of a text message, and Alexa reads that text message back to you. 
that is it. That is all Alexa is. Now, the services is pretty awesome what they actually do with it and what that metadata can contain, but essentially, it's sending a little tiny text message to Amazon. That's all we're talking about. Nothing scary there, right? Sending messages across the internet. Hopefully, nobody's scared by that, otherwise you wouldn't have found out about this place. But back to what he was trying to solve, he was trying to solve the, the notion of how do we move these files and folders? Now, in Linux and Unix, you just happen to have files and folders of the exact same thing. There's no real difference to the computer. It's like, it's a collection of things at this memory address. So, moving them around should be pretty straightforward. But because Stallman and Fox invented this thing called, or not invented, they rewrote Shell in open source, and for Stephen Bourne's sake, called it Born Again Shell, Linus Torvald needed a shell utility for Linux. He just went and took Stallman's. And to this day, Bash still credits Stallman and Fox as their creator. And it runs on every Linux box you've ever touched. It runs on every Mac you've ever touched. It will run on every Windows 10 machine where you run uh, Bash on uh, the one on Windows, which you can set up on Windows 10 Professional Edition. Or we'll talk about it in a second, get Bash. Yeah. Um, you can put any version of Linux actually on Windows now, because finally Windows said, you know what, we're not going to rewrite Bash. No, we're just going to let you run Ubuntu properly. Um, and the more complex your workflows get, the more you're going to run into things like continuous integration, and you know, servers out there, serverless, and all of these things. At the end of the day, all of those services like CircleCI and GitHub, our GitLab, CICD, Jenkins, Travis, all those services are just computers you don't own that run bash scripts for you. That's it. Those bash scripts tie together other things like glue, but there's no magic to it. It's just a computer running a script you gave it. So if you don't know how to script, that's a daunting challenge of like, what on earth do I do with these things? It's a weird black box that I can't unlock the awesome power of all of these amazing tools I keep hearing about at WordCamps and on the internet. But it's not that hard. And that's what we're going to spend the rest of the day looking at, is how to fundamentally go through this. So if you have a computer in front of you, open it on up. If you're on Mac or Linux, just open a terminal. It's there. And if you are on Windows 10, uh, go Google installing Linux or Windows subsystem. Or the quick answer, if you already have Git installed, is open up Git bash client. So if you have Git installed on a Windows machine, just open up Git bash. Most all of this will work. We start running into certain problems with certain tools, but we'll get there. So we're going to talk about these four areas. And again, I cannot teach you the entire the bash. It is so vast. It's been it's 31 years old now, and they've never stopped developing it. What it can do and the tool set for it is amazing. It's gigantic. But if you understand these four basic concepts, you can do anything. So again, something very scary. Um, wow, yeah, that's a lot of data. If you don't know what that is, wow, that's really confusing. So let's talk about what we're actually seeing on the screen. That first part where there's a prompt up at the top here and at the bottom, or if I actually go to you know, a terminal, it looks like that. Um, ah, crap. Excuse me, everybody. Uh, I didn't know it would do that. Uh, that is just telling you where on earth you are. By default, it tells you your computer name and your current directory, your username, and then a dollar sign. Just to tell you, that's where you're going to type it. Uh, that tilde is a shortcut for home. Uh, on a Linux directory, that'd be, you know, that's your user directory. Uh, just, if you just type that into a terminal, it'll always get you back home. CD there, but we'll get there. Anyway, so that's what we're typing after that prompt. There's a bunch of standard commands that are written in. But let's think about this conceptually. Like, let's think about it like Shelter or uh, Born did back in the day. All right, I am now at a terminal, and I have a blinking cursor and no other inputs. The first thing I need to know is where I am. I need that I am here on the map. That's PWD, Present Working Directory. So I've rewritten this as if bash commands were Alexa commands uh, or Google commands or Siri or whatever, um, try to. Th this part is directly out of the docs. If you type manual or man in any of these commands, you get th this definition and all of the docs. And uh, 
That's mine. But anyway, um, LS, what's the content directories? Uh, Stallman wrote this. Uh, hey, Bash, what's in this folder? Like, show me what's in this folder. LS. Uh, LS minus A. Show me everything in here, including the dots. Dots are very important. One dot means here. It's a self-referential dot. It means I. When you run a bash script we'll get to later, you do dot slash because it says, from here, look at this thing. You have to know where you are. Your computer needs to know where it is. Dot dot is another special character, pronounced dot dot. It means level above you. That's all it means. If there's a dot in front of a folder name, that means it's a hidden folder. So when I looked at ls, it wasn't there. When I looked at ls minus a, there it is. Like git, which we're not going to get into today, is uh, gives you a hidden folder when you're managing your stuff, so you don't always have to look at your git folder or worry about it. Manual, like I mentioned a second ago, in your computer, if you're completely offline, you're bored, just type man and any command in all of bash, and the entire manual is there at your disposal written by people like you and me. I showed Stephen Bourne, and I showed Brian Fox, and um, uh, Stallman, who like, just works down the road. Uh, I showed them because they're just people. Like, I met Stallman last month when I was here, and he's just some dude selling books and stuff canoes wearing a paper sign around his neck about, it's not free, it's open slash libre. Just some guy. <laughs> Like, he went to the event I was at, because he just, you like the open source stuff. It was written by people like you and me, in our language. A lot of it's really funny. There's like a lot of hidden jokes in there, a lot of dry humor throughout the docs. You gotta look for it. It's a lot of dry stuff as well. But everyone that writes any one of these tools wants you to use it at the same level that they conceived it at. And for you to elevate it, and you to elevate your work. So, if you're ever like on a plane, you got nothing to read, man, and just start going through all the commands, and even man, man works. It'll tell you how to use the manual. A lot of flags. So, when I said LS, A is a flag or a parameter I passed in. There are a lot of parameters. You do not have to know them all. If you just remember man and the command name, it will tell you every parameter you could possibly use. And it's already there. You don't have to be connected to the internet to do it. All right, so enough about that. So now we know where we are, we know how to use things, we know what's there, let's move around. So change directory, let's jump to another specified directory. Uh, CD dot dot, you see this a lot when people type, it means move up. You can actually chain that together. So CD dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot will move up three directories, because dot dot always means the level above. And if you ever look at your code, it's probably referring to a URL that's dot dot slash folder name or dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash folder name slash folder name slash folder name slash um, individual asset. That's how it's doing it. Again, it's just a server saying this is where that thing lives. So let's move around. Uh, make a dir, uh, let's make a new directory. Let's put it where I say to put it. If you can make a new directory right here if you don't put any other parameters, or I can say move a new directory over there and tell it exactly where I want that new directory to be. I can copy things. Makes sense to copy things. Then I can move things. And move things is actually a really, really big technical feat, believe it or not, from a computer standpoint. Because you're saying, move this thing from here to here, but it also says, move this thing from how I understand it to how I'm going to understand it. Meaning you can rename things. That is mostly how I use MB. Is I, how I rechange name, or how I change names around. Very quick way to do that. Uh, remove, pretty safe command actually. You know, you're like terrible stories about remove, but no, remove just gets rid of things, throws in the trash. Uh, if you're on RM minus I, it even gives you a prompt to say, are you sure? And my, we'll talk about in my bash profile, or uh, bash RC file in a minute, I have that set up. Um, RM minus RF, this is the dangerous one. Of anything, I'm going to say all day, this is the only one that's dangerous and you should like only use if you know what you're doing. Or if someone specifically tells you, go ahead and do that. Because this says, remove the minus R, says recursively, everything I can see below where I am and wherever you're pointing at, 
And F means force. There is no undo. This is just gone. So the story that guy who wiped out his entire business with one command, this was the command you ran. R minus R F slash, and it just wiped out the root directory and everything below it. Well, it was a made-up story, but he still technically could have done that. History? What did I type? That simple. We will show you. Uh, there's even some shortcuts like bang, which will just run the last command, and bang bang, which will run the last last two commands. And you can modify that, but that's getting too advanced for that. Clear? Uh, clear does exactly what it says. Clears the screen. Now, because this was written by Stallman, he put all of the Emacs shortcuts, so we have any Emac users in the room? Yeah, all, it's the exact same command structure. So command K, command uh, E, command A, those all work the same. So command K will clear the screen as well. But most people don't know Emacs, so these days anyhow. Um, open, we'll try to open the file in the default program that it should be used in. Uh, if it doesn't know, it will say, I don't know what to do. That's the thing, the bash will tell you what it can accomplish, try to help you accomplish it, but just give up if it doesn't know what to do. So a lot of safety in just opening things. So, so far, no scary concepts here, right? Like, we're looking at files, we're moving them around, we're seeing where we are, we're copying things, we're making new directories, we're moving things. These should all feel really familiar because this is how we use our computers. This is literally what we do with GUI drag and drop in the file system. Just now we're just doing it from teletyping little text messages to our machines. Now, there's a lot of tools built in to bash. A lot of them. One of the most popular, or one of the most powerful, is this thing called grep. General regular expression search. You can see how many times a word appears and where it appears inside of any folder. It is a ridiculously fast search, too. Uh, I'm going to have to mess this up a little bit, but uh, change it to... So, grep R. Grep R throws a bunch of flags that I don't remember all. So if I want to say awesome, and I'll say here. Here's every time I use the word awesome in my blog, which I keep Virgin Control on GitHub. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did, did anybody see how fast that scrolled? Because I'm still scrolling up. I use the word awesome a lot, apparently. <laughs> I'm, but that's how fast it took that to search. Was that searching in that directory? That it, it was searching in that folder and everything below it. Okay. Because that grub bar throws a bunch of flags. I'll get to aliases later and show that. Huh. Uh, go back here. Share. Nope. Wrong button. Come on. Why? Yeah. Sorry about that, everybody. All right. So I got about 15 minutes of clean question time, so I'm going to hurry this up a little bit. Curl. That's going to go to this URL and pull anything back. And there's a bunch of flags to this, too. So if you just curl something, you'll just pull it back across the wire. If you ever want to have fun and a lot of things we'll talk about later are fun based, um, curl, I can ask dadjoke.com, and it'll just give you a dad joke. That's a pretty easy service. <laughs> uh, uh, the curl will just go across. You can throw a minus I like it did there, and that just returns the header information. Like, you want to see if your cache is working? Do the same terminal, and it'll tell you immediately if your age, cache has an age to it. It's got an age, it's working. If it doesn't, well, probably not working. Them. Oh, man, I love them. Our VI, depending on which version you're using. Uh, it is the best text editor that you'll ever learn, but it'll take you a, a long time to learn it. Uh, but it's super powerful, and I highly encourage everyone to learn Vim. Um, the only thing you really need to know about Vim, though, uh, when starting out, is eventually you will run into it. There's, there's no exception to that in the world. Um, and two, it's really hard to escape from. In fact, uh, the number one thing still to this day, Google on Stack Overflow, is, or look up on Stack Overflow, is how to quit Vim. Uh, but it's I insert escape colon WQ and that gets you out of it, not right quits. When it when you actually wrap your head around them, it, these commands make way more sense. But again, it's a little bit of a learning curve. But it means it means you never have to take your hands off the keyboard ever. Again. Uh, nano if you just want a built-in quick editor, nano or pico are always there. 
Uh, a little easier because they have the control pet mail, the control menus at the bottom. Oh, I think it's full screen again. Uh, and there's so many more tools. There's so many more tools. There's thousands and thousands of them. Uh, if you're on Mac or Linux, you can brew these or apt get or uh, yeah. There's a lot of ways to get them. Uh, like brew is a package manager. So it's like the App Store, but everything's free, open source, and just installs in seconds with almost no overhead because it's just text files moving around. Like, it's really, really fast to install things. And then manage them very easily through one of these package management systems. One of my first things I highly encourage everyone to install is Calc. Like, you have one of the, your machine by the default what it is, is a giant calculator. So putting a tool in place where you can just command line advanced math, it's already there, and that library is brilliant. So I use it as my calculator. Uh, and you can tie into it with other tools we'll talk about later and make it do math, complex math for you. Um, Git. Who here uses Git on the projects? Yeah, everyone should, even especially content editors, as I showed there. Like, if you virtually control your content, you can search it like that and do fun things with it. Um, but the stupid content tracker, that's the actual in the manual. That's how they invented it. So when it gets confused, it just stops. But let's invoke some virtual control around here and see what's going on. Uh, there are a bunch of command line search engines. Uh, I really like DuckDuckGo, I'm a huge fan of theirs. So DuckDuckGo has a command line tool. Uh, there's also Lynx. Who, who here remembers Lynx? Yeah, it's still going and it's awesome. Uh, I used it the other day to, to like pull almost 7,000 URLs off a site. It took like three seconds total, like stuff that in a file. Um, but there's so many more tools. I can't sit here and talk about all of them. Drush for Drupal, WPCLI for the win, um, Composer, uh, BHAT for behavioral testing, Backstop for visual regression testing. Again, these are all the slides. I'm just kind of skip through them because of timing. But there are thousands and thousands and thousands. The whole point of today, though, is if you don't know what the command, like those basic command line functions, or uh, commands, and you're like scared to touch bash, this world's completely shielded off to you. Like 99% of these tools don't have a GUI equivalent. They're built to do a functional thing very well. But there probably is a way to do it through GUI, but you're gonna jump through hoops to get there. Or maybe pay someone to develop has developed a GUI for you. Versus I can just brew, install a library, and bam, I am working in that library immediately. Same thing with GitHub. You will hit people's repos and like, oh, you just clone that down and just start using it. And in the instructions, that's basically all it says. Like, just run this, and now it's installed. Again, they're not going to build a GUI for you. It's so much faster to develop for the command line. It's so much faster. But a lot of developers just don't bother. We're going to build a tool for myself. I'm going to use the command line. Other people want to use it. Here it is. But that's as far as I'm going with it. Thousands of people, and people just like us. How many people in this room have something on GitHub that is shareable, that they, like, a tool that they've written for someone else? Awesome, there's a few hands, yes. Be proud, be proud. You're making open source happen, literally. All right, last two sections, and I'm really uh, short on time now. Yes, aliases. So, there's a way to tell Bash, hey, when I type this, do this other thing, and also, I want these settings to be true. Um, they're hidden folders called that Bash Profile and Bash RC. On Mac, it's Bash Profile. On Linux, it's Bash RC. There is technically a difference between the two. I'm not getting into it today. That's a whole debate. Um, but if you alias things, when you type one thing, another thing will happen. That that's very simple. So instead of typing ls minus a, I can just type la. Or instead of typing clear, I can just type cl. Or if I want to tell that into the Rainmaker or the, the under, Weather Underground server and get the weather on my uh, on my machine, which I've never done on this machine, this is a new machine, uh, or new for presentations. Uh, the thing is, nobody's paying attention to this server because it's just a server that's been running since the 90s, and every now and again it just falls over. So we're going to stop that for now. It was trying, just couldn't get there. All right, um, and you can export paths. So when you install a tool, you gotta tell it where it is. Uh, who you update from PHP 5 to PHP 7, you're probably gonna have to set the path for that. Um, this is just an easy way to do that. Set your export paths. 
Every time bash loads, it sets all this path for you, and you're good to go. Uh, and then you got to tell bash, of course, to use it, and that's what source does, but we're not going to get into that today. And then the most powerful thing in the entire world called scripting. The reason Bash won, Bash was shell by Born wasn't the first. He fully acknowledges there was C shell first and there was other prompts other people had written. The idea that we need to move these files around is not new. Why shell won and why that was the one that Stallman picked to rewrite as open source for all of us, um, it, it, does make, it does one thing better than anything else that was ever written, pretty much ever. And this idea of taking the output from one command and piping it into another command. Now, I'm not showing that on the screen. Oh, sorry. Let me get through this first, and then I'll show you the example of what I mean. Um, but I changed this section last night, thinking this would be easier to flow. Um, uh, that's why like, the shell scripting like, took off and this ability to tie the tools together. But again, if you don't know what any of this is, this is like, just confusing nonsense on the screen. So let's walk through this. This is a very simple script that literally hello worlds. Um, and explain the parts of this. Like, it's really not that much to a script, really not. Start with the shebang. Uh, hashtag bang is the shebang. Uh, after that, if, if that's the very first characters that it, bash encounters in a file, it knows that everything after that is going to be the path of what it needs to do to actually run what's in that file, how to interpret that file. So it doesn't have to be bash, it can be slash bin, slash curl, or um, python, or whatever. But for writing shell scripts, it needs to be bash, because that's what we're writing, we're writing bash scripts. Uh, tell it what, what, what to run. Um, after, that first time, after that first character shebang, Everything else behind a hashtag is just going to be a, a comment. We all know what comments are. Um, we're probably going to name it .sh for .shell file. And then we need to tell our computers that, hey, it's OK to run this. Because you just type arbitrary files, your computer's like, that's just a bunch of text. Unless you say, they tell the computer, like, no, you have control, you have permissions to interpret what's in that file and go ahead and run that. And that's what a change mod, uh, change Change file, uh, change file modes. That's what Shemad stands for. Um, you can 777 to say everybody can do everything. That's super dangerous. Uh, 755 is the proper way to do that. And it's like, neither the owner can do anything, but other people, they can see it. And they can use it. Um, then to run it, we tell it dot slash. Again, dot is, I'm here. From here, evaluate this file right here. And it will. You can also put these things in a bin folder, a user bin folder, and then just run them from wherever. And you don't need the .sh anymore. So you can just type like MDC sync, and it syncs my databases from my live environment to my other environments on the block. It just runs that little script for me from anywhere, no matter where I'm running it. So let's look at a couple examples really quick. I know we're really racing at the top end here, um, and I really need to get the advanced stuff out of the way. But here's a great example of a uh, well, no, actually. Uh, but here's a very simple script that makes sure that my sites are up to date and plugins and themes by going through this list, echoing out in this list. This is logic, basic lot, computer logic, uh, and a for loop to spit out all of that information, a plugin list and theme list for all four of those sites. It takes me a second to run it, and when it spits all back out, I have a full report. I can run it whenever I want. Um, Opening sites in Firefox, for instance. This is uh, written for my Mac, not for this machine. So this would actually fail if I ran it here. But um, you can do a bunch of book. There's a bunch of ways to manage bookmarks. But if you want to set a demo up and have everyone run the same set of windows, it's really easy just to pass them, like, here's that list, and just run the script, and you're set up to go. Uh, I mentioned earlier, set up demo sites on Pantheon. Um, or, uh, setting up websites for me is very easy. It's the script, literally. You can have the script. It's just a script. Uh, and then you can start doing very, very, very complex things. Like, I'm going to take all of these tools together and I'm going to push things around and test them. And if they test pass, I'm going to push it to this next thing and test it again. And if that passes, then I'm going to push it to production. That's how I publish my blog. 
like I tied together BHAT for behavioral testing and Backstop for visual regression testing, and I push things around and make sure the robots do the testing for things I commonly miss. But for those of you who are like, yeah, I use Bash, I know all of this. I was came in here because you said there's some advanced stuff. That's where we're at now, and we'll race through it to the very end. Because I asked back in February, like, hey, has anybody got any suggestions? Turns out that's a lot of people have some opinions and suggestions about this. But if you just take this last section of slides, there's a lot of gold in here. But uh, creating aliases and uh, pushing up, pushing up does so the lap, it like, just scrolls through history. You can save a lot of typing just by pushing up. Uh, control E, Control E to jump around. Again, that's uh, Control K, that comes from Emacs uh, origin. Uh, reverse command search. Look that up. That is super, super handy. Uh, the asterisk character. Asterisk character lets you do a lot of things. It's kind of dangerous at the same time because it's, uh, it's the wild card. So if I wanted to get rid of asterisk dot JPEG out of a folder, it would just get rid of all the JPEGs. Or asterisk dot text, it would kill all the text files. It works the other way too. If I have a bunch of different types of files, um, like screenshots, I can just type screen asterisk and it will just get rid of everything that starts with screen. Uh, that's how I clean the screenshots a lot when I'm cleaning my desktop. Uh, tab piping, you can take, again, air output from one command and pipe it to something else. So if I have one of those LSs, like an LS in my directory, I can just put that into a file somewhere. Like, it's one step. There's not a lot to do with that. If you uh, want a bunch of aliases preset and don't really want to do the work of setting them up, uh, there's a lot of examples in the world. This is my favorite one um, from uh, NateLandow.com. Uh, I actually use it on this machine. Uh, CD minus is the last channel button with CD. It's super powerful. Most people have never seen that before. And I love that one. Um, if you are doing script, like this is for reals, uh, you're almost set strict mode. If you don't know what unofficial bash script, strict mode is, look it up. Uh, I know the company I used to work with, this is mandatory at the top of every bash script that runs in production. Because this says, if it fails, fail very loudly and quickly and tell me exactly what happened. It's everywhere. It's at your disposal. Don't be afraid of it. For everything else you ever want to learn about it, beyond the day, there's so much written about it. Like, Bash is 31 years old, and people have never stopped writing about it or developing it. The tools are there. And if you're like, I, this all sounds great, I'd like to try out some command line stuff and just get used to the command line, but I don't want to ever touch my computer, I'm still scared of that. I understand it. I was there once myself. There's a website you can go to, telehack.com, and it's not Bash, but it will get used to using a command interface because it's just fun, you can't mess anything up. This is a service that's been running for years and years and years. Uh, you can do things like Telnet and Grep, and, uh, or not Grep, um, uh, Primes. Just print all the Primes, and fun things like that. Thousands of documentations out there, pieces of documentation, a bunch of cheat sheets when you get started. But just dive in and have fun. Like, you're supposed to clap along with these guys at this point. <laughs> Do this, I always run out of time, but I always have like, one question. Right um, this is for the video people. So when um, when I'm running something, I don't know if it's in Git, and I'm just learning, and I'm the, the, the dealing with moving directories around and stuff and things when the um, FTP client, you know, mm -hmm. does bad things. Um, and and I get out of the mode where I see the command line and it's like I'm in like some more, it's running something, but it's it's like in a it looks as though it's running something. I figure this is a generic enough question for everybody, and you don't see anything. You see like a post stuff that showed up on your command line, but then you're in this mode that it just, it doesn't end the screen for you, and yet it didn't finish. Oh, this. This is a very, yeah, yeah, this is a very generic question. Yeah, yeah. so if you've got hung processes, there's a couple things. One, just wait. Like, just because the command line is quick to run doesn't mean the actual process that's going to run is going to be quick. Some things take a long time, especially if you're using things like tools like Composer or um, NPM. Like, some things just take a long damn time. Just wait. Um, two, things get hung sometimes. That's what Command-K is for, or Command, I'm sorry, Control-C. Control-C will kill a process. 
Um, or you can open another window and to check to see if it's hung up or if you, if you just need to wait. Um, you just run PS. PS will tell you all of the bash processes you can see running. And if it's something that should have taken a minute and you're five minutes in and it's still running, kill it, try it again. Something's gone wrong. Um, but yeah, PS will tell you what everything's running, like an activity monitor and yeah. So if you type in PS, even though something looks like it's not functioning, yeah, so that, would, new, that would override what is happening. Open a new terminal window, type PS, and it will give you the information of what processes are running. Oh, okay. And beyond that, um, you can man PS and it will tell you exactly what those fields mean. All right, that's all the time, unfortunately. But I'm happy to talk to everyone. I'll be hanging out at the happiness bar for the next little bit. Um, thank you very much, everybody.